Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. La primera lectura está tomada del libro de los Hechos de los Apóstoles, en el capítulo 2. Entonces, Pedro, con los once, se puso de pie y dijo a voz en cuello, Compatriotas judíos y todos ustedes que están en Jerusalén, déjenme explicarles lo que sucede. Presten atención a lo que les voy a decir. Por tanto, Sépalo bien todo Israel que a este Jesús, a quien ustedes crucificaron, Dios lo ha hecho Señor y Mesías. Cuando oyeron esto, todos se sintieron profundamente conmovidos y les dijeron a Pedro y a los otros apóstoles, Hermanos, ¿qué debemos hacer? Arrepiéntase. Y bautícese cada uno de ustedes en el nombre de Jesucristo para el perdón de sus pecados y recibirán el, el don del Espíritu Santo. En efecto, la promesa es para ustedes, para sus hijos y para todos los extranjeros, es decir, para todos aquellos a quienes el Señor nuestro Dios quiera llamar. Y con muchas otras razones, les exhortaba insistentemente, «Sálvense de esta generación perversa». Así pues, los que recibieron su mensaje fueron bautizados, y aquel día se unieron a la iglesia unas tres mil personas. Palabra del Señor. Our selection from the Psalter this morning is Psalm 116. Mr. Perko and I will chant it using modified Anglican chant. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I call upon him. The courts of death entangled me. The grip of the grave took a hold of me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray to you, save my life. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Alleluia. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second reading this morning is from First Peter chapter one. If you invoke as Father 
the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, then live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. Christ was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him, you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth so that you have genuine mutual love, now love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God, the word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all of the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. And then one of them whose name was Cleopas answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In English theater, Shakespeare is the master. And one of his favorite ways of bringing drama to a climax is what's called the recognition scene. That's where the scales fall from the eyes, and suddenly the truth about a person is revealed. The unknown stranger, the disguise is taken off, an enemy turns into a friend, or maybe somebody we thought was a friend all along is revealed to be an enemy. It says that there's only four plays that Shakespeare wrote that don't have a recognition scene. And I think one of the greatest comes at the end of his play called Pericles, the Prince of Tyre. And in this, there's a young girl who's brought to the grieving Pericles in the hope that her singing is going to break through all of his sadness. And as she comes into court and she begins singing her life story, he realizes who the child is. She's Marina, his precious daughter, whom he thought was lost years ago as an infant. And although no one else is aware of it, 
he realizes that all of heaven is rejoicing because he can hear the music of the spheres. Now, I once read about a performance that had an audience in tears when it reached that scene. Most of the people could hardly understand what the words meant. The Shakespearean language was too difficult. And yet they cried because they knew about separation and loss and the joy that a reunion brings. You see, that's the power of drama. You could say that many of the Easter stories in the Gospels are recognition scenes. The astonishing reversal of separation and loss and the joyful reunion of the followers and friends with the risen Lord Jesus. Think of Mary Magdalene supposing him to be the gardener and then hearing him pronounce her name as he, she calls him Rabboni. Think of the 11 locked behind doors and the visitor who greets them in only the way that Jesus could saying, peace be with you. Think of Thomas who would not believe in his confession of faith, my Lord and my God. Think of Peter and the disciples after the miraculous cast your fish. And then Peter realizes who it is and he cries out, it is the Lord. But none of those Easter recognition scenes is told with such artistry as St. Luke's story of the road to Emmaus. That's the one that Deacon Charles just read to us. The two disconsolate disciples are schlepping back home and they're joined by this unknown stranger and they have their conversation on the road. There's the supper at which the guest turns into being the host. There's the familiar action of bread blessed and broken and that moment of recognition. And so excited they return to the city to tell the others. It's a story that's exquisitely told. Now, lots of non-Christians have questions for God. Lots of Christians have questions for God. I have questions for God, as I'm sure you do too. And the questions of a Christian aren't so different from the questions of a non-Christian. Here's a common one. How can we believe when there's so much suffering? This is the number one question that non-Christians ask. And Christians ask it too. I ask it. With this virus, with death, disease, disasters, and depression all around us, how can we believe? Well, this morning, if you're, answering, if you're asking that question, we're at the right passage here in Luke chapter 24. How can we believe when there's so much suffering? You see, that's the question that this couple was asking on this first Easter Sunday. They're leaving Jerusalem after the most eventful weekend in their lives. Now, presumably, they've come up to Jerusalem for the Passover, and while they were there, their master, Jesus, had been arrested and executed. So we just try to feel their pain and disappointment when we hear the story. As they talked and discussed these things along the road with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? That's brilliantly mischievous, isn't it? The Bible says they stood still and their faces were downcast. I don't know about you, but I've been so overwhelmed by what I was saying that I had to stop walking. Sometimes you just can't carry on as normal and you just stop there in your tracks and pull yourself together to answer. And the scripture says one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one who's visited Jerusalem and doesn't know the things that have happened there these last several days? And Jesus asked, like what things? You see, Jesus really wants to enter into their grief here. Now, isn't that fascinating? He could end their grief in just an instant. I mean, he could throw off his cloak and say, look, it's me. But no, he doesn't do it that way. First, he enters into their grief and he asks, what things? And so they say, well, you know, about Jesus of Nazareth, the prophet, 
He was so powerful, and we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Now just feel the pain there. Jesus wasn't just their beloved leader. He wasn't just their wise and uh, helpful rabbi and teacher. He was the one that they thought was the Messiah, or at least they hoped he was the Messiah. They put their trust in Jesus to be the Savior. So when he died, their hope died. For them, Christ's death was not just a personal tragedy of a friend and a teacher. This couple was facing the prospect that maybe there was no redemption. Maybe no one is ever going to come to our rescue. Remember, all of Israel was under occupation by the Romans, and they had been waiting and waiting for a savior. So they're thinking maybe no one can rescue us. I mean, if Jesus gets crucified, what hope can there be? I mean, just imagine yourself, you know, you're sinking in quicksand and the only person for miles says, don't worry, I'll save you. And then they plunge into the mire and they quickly, they drown right before your eyes. Well, that's kind of disheartening, isn't it? Because all you're left with, I guess I'm going to be next. Well, Jesus comes into the world and says, don't worry, I'm the long promised savior. I'll rescue you. And then he dies right there in front of them. And the scripture doesn't say, but maybe this couple had even seen it happen. Maybe they'd been at the site of Christ's crucifixion. But if not, they had still heard about all those things because they were followers. And it's no wonder that they're downcast. How on earth can they believe in the midst of all this suffering? Well, they had all the information they needed. In verses 21 through 24, they say, it's the third day since this has happened. Now they're Jews, so they realize the significance of the third day. Jesus had repeatedly told them he'd be killed and then rise on the third day. And in verses 23 and 24, they admit that there are lots of eyewitnesses to the empty tomb, and there's even been angelic messages telling everyone that he's risen. But you know, none of this shakes them from their grief. Jesus had told them. The whole Old Testament had told them. All of the prophets, everything that they'd been taught about the third day was coming true. But all they can think about is that he's died. And that hope has died. The curious thing is, is what does Jesus do? You know what he does? He gives them a Bible study. I mean, instead of just telling him, look, it's me, I'm here, don't worry, it's all okay, he says, you know how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the scriptures say that the Messiah had to suffer these things and then enter into glory? I mean, the whole Bible is about this. And Jesus says the whole Bible for thousands of years has been a message that a Christ, a Messiah, will come and will suffer and then will enter into glory. Which means essentially that hope will come, hope will suffer, and hope will rise again. We say it every week during the Mass. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. That's the shape of God's hope for the world. Christ will come to our suffering world and will suffer with us. He took up upon our infirmities and carried our sorrows. You see, to a suffering world, Jesus says, go ahead, load me up with all your griefs and I'll carry them. He carried our sorrows. And then on the cross, as the prophet Isaiah said, by his wounds, we are healed. You see, first he dies, and then he enters into glory. This is what the prophet Isaiah foretold. After suffering, then comes glory. After the cross, then comes resurrection. And Jesus, later on that evening, gives them a picture of it with the breaking of the bread. Did you notice how significant the breaking of the bread was in this story? It says, when he was at table with them, 
he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and then began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Now you might say, well, why is that significant? Well, think of it. Jesus was forever teaching that he was the bread of life. And at the Last Supper, he picked up the bread and he said, this is my body. And then what does he do with it? He tears it apart violently. This is my body, broken. Why is it broken? So he can feed us, so we can have life. It's through the broken body of Jesus. That's why, you know, the priest holds up the broken bread to show you. We don't hold up the whole loaf of bread or the whole piece of pita or the whole wafer, whatever it is that we have for bread that day. After we've broken it and it's been torn apart, then we hold it up to show you, to show you the broken body of Jesus, to show you that it's by his suffering that we're going to enter into glory. And when this couple have this communion-like moment with Jesus, that's when they get it. Jesus is the one who dies and is torn apart so that we can have life. His death wasn't a tragedy. It was just a step on the way to glory. First the cross, then the resurrection. First the bread is broken, and then new life is given to the world. First it's Good Friday, and then it's Easter. And that's what God is doing in the world. Through suffering, we'll be able to enter into glory. As it was with Jesus, so it will be with us. So how can we believe when there's so much suffering? Well, it's because we believe in Jesus. We believe in the suffering God who knows our suffering, who carries our suffering who comes to be with us in our suffering. I will never leave you or forsake you. And he shows himself to us in the breaking of the bread. Amen. Please join with us now as we recite the faith of the church in the Nicene Creed. Creemos en un solo Dios, Padre Todopoderoso, Creador de cielo y tierra, de todo lo visible e invisible. Creemos en un solo Señor Jesucristo, Hijo único de Dios, nacido del Padre ante de todos los siglos, Dios de Dios. Luz de luz, Dios verdadero de Dios verdadero, engendrado, no creado, de la misma naturaleza que el Padre, por quien todo fue hecho, que por nosotros y por nuestra salvación bajó del cielo. Por obra del Espíritu Santo se encarnó de María la Virgen y se hizo hombre. Por nuestra causa fue sacrificado en tiempos de Poncio Pilato, pareció y fue sepultado. Resucitó al tercer día, según las Escrituras, subió al cielo y está sentado a la derecha del Padre. De nuevo vendrá con gloria para juzgar y vivos y muertos, y su reino no tendrá fin. Creemos en el Espíritu Santo, Señor y Dador de vida, que procede del Padre y del Hijo, y con el Padre y el Hijo recibe una misma adoración y gloria, y que habló por los profetas. Creemos en la iglesia, que es una santa, católica y apostólica. Reconocemos un solo bautismo para el perdón de los pecados. Esperamos la resurrección de los muertos y la vida del mundo futuro. Amén. The prayers of the people. Let us pray. 
for the church, especially Michael, our presiding bishop, Peter, our diocesan bishop, and for Greg and Anne, our priests, and for Charles, our deacon. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all monks, nuns, friars, and oblates, and for the Brotherhood of St. Gregory, and for all religious in our Episcopal Church and the Anglican Communion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our parish family here at the Monastery Church of St. Bernard, that we may show our thanksgiving to God with acts of love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are affected by the virus, for all who have tested positive, all who are waiting for test results, and all who are in isolation, for those who have already died of the coronavirus and their families and friends who mourn them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all health caregivers, nurses, physicians, aides, EMTs, paramedics, technicians and therapists who have closed contact with patients and for the patients themselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Send your spirit to touch the hearts of our world's leaders. Open their minds to the great worth of human life and the responsibilities that accompany leadership. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your love calls us to be your people by sharing our gifts. We share in your mission. We ask you, Lord, to use technology to continue to shape us into a community of faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And dear God, we pray for families that are torn apart, hearts that are hurting, people dealing with overwhelming problems, individuals in the claws of addiction, and for those in recovery. We pray for all of those in our hearts. Send healing to those who are ill or in pain. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all of those who experience life's dark sides, those who struggle with mental illness, sudden tragedy or severe depression. Help those who face the darkness to find the light. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, heal us that we, in turn, may heal the wounded. Help us to be instruments of love, justice, and peace. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Welcome. We're glad to have you worshiping with us this morning, even though it's digital. Whether you're joining us live on Facebook or on YouTube, we're glad to have you here as part of the monastery community of St. Bernard de Clavaux. I'm so grateful to Gretchen Avidar, who is moderating for us. If you're following us live on Facebook right now, she's responding to your messages on chat. Good morning, Gretchen. Uh, we're glad to have her being a part of this ministry. I'm also grateful to Raul Diego Vizaga, who is producing all of our worship online, doing all the editing, all of the camera work, and all of the behind-the-scenes work. 
Diego does have his own production company, but he is volunteering because he's a member of our vestry and a member of the church, and we're grateful for all of his gifts for this as well. I want to let you know that our readers this morning pre-recorded um, their readings, Lalith McDonald, Delson Innocent, and Deacon Charles Humphreys, in order for us to follow uh, the guidelines of our bishop and our community. We're limiting the number of the people who are here in the church at any one time, so I'm grateful for them being able to take their time and to be able to come early and to pre-record so we can include them in this service. This morning, I want to let you know that you can make your offering online. You can also text to give by using your cell phone. The number that you see on the bottom of the screen, you just type in the amount that you want to give, and that will start some prompts and a little dialogue back and forth. If you're a member of the church, it will automatically put you to your pledge and put you to your pledge number. If you're not a member, we welcome your gifts as well, and we'll be able to send you a receipt uh, for your donation. Thank you so much for your generosity. Right now, while we're not able to have church in person, your gifts mean more than ever. The monastery has been dependent for many, many years on the weddings, receptions, quince, photo photography, and filming that takes place here, and all of that has come to a grinding halt, and with that, all of the money that people pay to be able to rent our venue for their photography and receptions and, and parties. So we're so grateful for all of the gifts that are given to us this time. Let us remember the words of our Lord Jesus, who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive.
Pray, my brothers and sisters, that this my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Father, the Almighty. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at my hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing. Always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he's destroyed death. And by his rising to life again, he's won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and dark angels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you've made known to us in creation, and the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you've delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you've brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. And therefore, according to his command, O oh Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O oh Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ in his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Remember all your people and those who seek your truth. Remember all those in our parish who have committed themselves to our prayers, and our families and loved ones, the sick, and all who suffer. Lord, remember our families and loved ones who have gone to their rest in the hope of rising again. Bring them and all the departed into the light of your presence. Have mercy on us all. Make us worthy to share eternal life with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, with our patron, Saint Bernard de Claveau, and all the saints who found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Lord, I'm not worthy to receive you, but speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. Angel, this is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you to preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. No es suficiente aclamar a Jesucristo nuestro Señor y Rey. Nuestra misión en la vida es para hacer realidad su reino entre nosotros y para llevarlo a quienes nos rodean por nuestras palabras y hechos. La forma de hacer esto es vivir como Él vivió, para otros, en amor y servicio. Que Dios Todopoderoso te bendiga por esta tarea, el Padre y el Hijo y el Espíritu Santo. Amén. <tose>